Well, good afternoon. We're here with TriMet General Manager Neil McFarlane for, I think, the fifth Portland Transport Conversation uh, with Neil. Neil, we appreciate you being here today. Well, it's always a pleasure. So we have to start out talking about our backdrop here. Yeah. Uh, we are very grateful to the Portland Opera for hosting us today. Uh, where I'm told the building is literally four feet from the edge of the bridge. Uh, so why don't we start by talking about how the bridge is going? The bridge is going great. And actually, I can say from firsthand experience, I was out there yesterday afternoon, happened to be in the middle of a thunderstorm, but nonetheless, <laughs> I was out there. And I can tell you that uh, we're literally three sections away from the bridge being complete in the middle, and those sections are each 16 feet each. So you can begin to do the math. It's not very far from completion. We had a milestone this week, too, which is the bridge is actually connected to this side of the river uh, firmly and, and formally with a concrete pour. So now the bridge is actually uh, anchored on both sides of the, of the Willamette River. Um, overall, the bridge is about 75 in that range complete. Um, it looks like, and that's, that's an, what, what really remains to be done, uh, is, of course, the, the civil work, things like handrails, the barriers that will protect pedestrians from the, uh, from the buses, the rail, uh, light rail, and the streetcar that will use the center tracks. Um, and it's actually um, going very well. It's right on schedule. Uh, so actually, the bridge as, a, as an entity will be completed later this summer. Uh, we expect that center pour uh, to be complete uh, really around um, the first half of May or so this year. So we're really excited to see it move uh, mm -hmm. as quickly as it is and come up out of the ground. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that about half the concrete that goes into bridge goes under the ground. And so um, it, it's really quite, uh, quite exciting to see the other second half of the concrete create, uh, I think, what's going to be a really important form for the city, you know, an important uh, piece of infrastructure for the city for a long time. Great. Well, one of the questions we've gotten from our readers is whether, in fact, because the bridge is so far along, if you will open it up to uh, bikes and pedestrians uh, before transit operations start? Um, I think the answer is probably no, unfortunately. <laughs> but let me tell you why. There's actually some really good reasons, which is that as we go through the actual completion of the civil bridge itself, then we turn it over to contractors who install our overhead electrification, our communications, or what we call our, our systems contractors. So there's a period of time and then we come back and do some very elaborate safety certification and testing along the way. So those are all increments of time. The next thing up, though, and actually this is the busy part of uh, calendar uh, uh, 15, the first half of calendar 15, is we actually have to train every bus operator, every rail operator, every streetcar operator, not only with classroom time, but with actual time on a vehicle on the bridge going across the bridge. So, we're shoehorning all of that in before the scheduled opening, opening on September 12th, 2015. So right now, it doesn't look like there's uh, an opportunity to do much very early, but we'll keep looking for the opportunities. I know a lot of people I talk to say, you know, I remember being out on the Glen Jackson Bridge when it <laughs> opened and, you know, to actually have humans walk on bridges uh, yeah. before they're turned over to the vehicles that uh, yeah, use them every day is a, is a pretty important thing. Big. Great thing for bridge pedal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would be, no question. <laughs> so leapfrogging from the bridge to the Portland Milwaukee project, um, probably the number one question that our readers keep asking is, how will that actually be uh, operated in terms of where the northern terminus is uh, for service? Uh, will it be interlined with the yellow line? Uh, is that planning coming along? Can you share any more? So in terms of the rail operations plan, it is coming along. Um, the reason that there is something called an orange line instead of the yellow line, which I think started all that confusion, mm -hmm. is that there is an unequal demand. We actually believe that passenger demand on the Milwaukee half the line will be higher than it is on the interstate part of the line. So over time, what we expect is that we'll need to turn some trains around during the peak hours when we're serving the peak hour demand uh, at Union Station. Uh, Day-based trains and most of the trains will continue through uh, to interstate. They'll actually change their sign from orange to yellow uh -huh. when they get to PSU. Um, and so um, they will be through routed um, uh, for the most part. And the only exception will be a few of those trains that are in the peak hour that uh, are needed on the south end that are needed on the north end. 
And will there be a way for somebody getting on in, say, Milwaukee to know if they're on a train that's going through to North Portland or if it's a train that is going to turn around at Union Station? Yes, we'll make sure that we the schedules denote which mm -hmm. which ones, and we'll try to augment that with um, st with the actual announcements as well. Okay, all right. Um, well, the next question is about the the project that isn't anymore, uh, the Columbia River Crossing. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, there are people who are fans of the project. There are uh, the camp that I'm in, which didn't like this particular design and thought it was too auto oriented. Um, but part of the project would have gotten light rail to Vancouver, which I think is a goal that, that most of our readers uh, are in alignment with. So uh, with this project now officially shutting down, um, you know, the, the common sense alternative, which was uh, the configuration that I and some others uh, had proposed, uh, would say, let's get there in steps. And the first step would be to get light rail to Hayden Island. Um, does TriMet have any beginnings of ideas along that line? Or you know, how are you regrouping in light of the shutdown of the project? Well, so first of all, remember um, our position in that project, which mm -hmm. is, you know, we were a partner agency, but we were not a lead agency. You were the conduit for $850 million. We were in the last, uh, in the last configuration. Um, here's what I'd say about it. I, I think it's a little soon to define the next steps from our standpoint. I don't have any magic plan. I don't think anybody else does. I think one thing that I would have... Uh, a conclusion of is that that's still a substandard bridge for an interstate highway uh, with the lift span and frankly with seismic um, concerns that I think don't deserve to be um, on a major interstate between you know Canada and, and Mexico so I think that's still a problem that's there that we've got to address um, and related to the transit elements I think there is great agreement um, that the um, that the need in that quarter is a multimodal need and that we've got mm -hmm. to serve it with strong transit connections. Now I would tell you, and I think you know this about me, I'm pretty ecumenical when it comes to transit mode. I love buses, trains, mm -hmm. and you know, any sort of transit. Um, so I think, you know, when I think about any kind of resurgence of the project, we still got a, a substandard bridge and, and we still have to serve that corridor with really great transit. I don't know, I don't have a, a, a notion, and TriMet's not really doing any work right now on how uh, to resurface that. And my thought is that really one of the bigger, the, the issue that I think, um, if you will, derailed this in, um, in the uh, state legislature was a lack of involvement from the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think local, locally we need to see some um, involvement from the state of Washington before it, if you will, resurfaces. Well, that uh, uh, actually takes some of our questions out of order because I think that touches on an issue that, that we're seeing. Um, there were certainly uh, state senators in Washington who objected to uh, the transit component uh, in funding the bridge package as a whole. Uh, you know, we've just seen a ballot measure in Tigard that puts limitations on high capacity transit. Clackamas County passed a ballot measure last year mm -hmm. that, that, well, didn't have a lot of effect on the current project. Um, states a pretty clear preference. So you know, are we seeing a trend that particularly suburban jurisdictions are looking at high capacity transit more skeptically and what does that say about opportunities to advance a, a Columbia River project or you know, any HCT projects that are going to go into the suburbs? Well it's an interesting question and I, I can't tell you that I have any great um, wisdom about answering it. I would just make a few observations about it. Um, one is that when we go down, for example, and talk to community members in the Southwest Corridor, in Tigard, uh, Walton, uh, Sherwood, there is a great demand there for more transit. Mm -hmm. uh, but to a very large extent, some of what the neighbors are uh, and our customers are talking about is better local connections within their own communities, as well as the, the if you will, the trunk line into Portland. So one of my objectives is to prove to those communities that we have, um, we, that we can be responsive to those, uh, those desires and needs. And we'll, I know we're gonna talk about service enhancement plans as we get going, but that's the mechanism I think we use mm -hmm. for that. Um, I, I think we also sometimes think about the current situation and say, gosh, isn't it awful? But you know, these projects has all, have always been hard. Mm -hmm. um, somebody pulled out not long ago uh, a, a southeast corridor study, uh, part of a, 
planning document that, believe it or not, had my name on it, and it was dated, I think, from 1981. <laughs> so these yeah. things take uh -huh. a long time, and um, we've had a lot of false starts, for example, on the project that's under construction behind us. Um, so I don't, I don't say there's no hope. I say that sometimes it just takes longer. Um, uh, the other ob observation I, I have is that um, transit in central Portland is a very ubiquitous, mm -hmm. important uh, service. And um, you know, frankly, our service is thinner when you get out to the suburbs, and our market share is somewhat less. Um, so I think there's an extra burden of, of sort of proving the value mm -hmm. of transit in some of the communities where it's not quite as obvious as it might be in central Portland. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's focus on Southwest Quarter a little bit. Um, so the City of Tigard has passed a ballot measure that, as I understand it, says that they are opposed to high capacity transit until and unless there's a vote of the electorate there to approve a project. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that mean for planning? Obviously, City of Tigard can't constrain TriMet or Metro, so you know, I assume the steering committee is still chugging along, but what does it say about the participation of the Mayor of Tigard on that steering committee? Uh, what's the impact on the project and how it's going to progress? So I think it's a little soon to know to have a really very specific roadmap in response to that, but um, one thing that I would say is that you know this is a, a long-term study and it was identified as the next priority regional corridor in the Metro's high-capacity transit plan. We looked at the whole region and the various competing corridors just came out very clearly on top. Um, and so there is still a great deal of, I think, interest in the region about this corridor. Uh, and I think it's, it's important. It's I-5 South, after all. It's the major connection within Oregon. And uh, we need better and improved high-capacity transit in the corridor, to me, is long-term, is, is absolutely clear. Um, mode, alignment, and how, all subject to the study. The second thing I note about this is that this is still under Metro's lead, and so we do follow the lead of our regional planning agency, and TriMet at this point in time is a participating agency that helps develop alternative transit alignments and networks that help evaluate, help uh, progress the evaluation along. Um, right now, um, we're still in an early stage of all of that work, and uh, current plan is to progress that to at least the next decision point. But I do think that before we, as a region, decide to invest a great deal of money in a DEIS effort, for example, draft environmental impact statement effort, um, we need to have some clarity from the uh, Tigard City Council, and I think they would want that themselves. So I think we progress a bit and then really um, try to get some clarity uh, from the Tigard community. You know, you and I go back enough that we might remember one of the demises of a south-north ballot measure. Mm -hmm. And I remember after that, uh, the, one of the Metro councils, councilors at the time, a fellow by the name of Ed Washington, uh, conducted a whole series of what he called listening posts around the region. And the question he was asking is, what message are you, are you sending us with this? Um, and sometimes those messages aren't really clear in a quick yes-no vote in an electorate. And as you well know, that tiger vote was pretty, pretty even split, pretty close to 50-50. So um, that's a fair question. What did you really mean uh -huh. by your vote? And I think that the, the Tiger City Council will be, in, um, will be querying their citizens about that over the next few months. Okay. I think I remember testifying at one of those listening posts. <laughs> I'm sure you probably um, did. So you mentioned mode and alignment for Southwest Corridor. Uh, as I understand, the steering committee is about to throw out some options and narrow the range of consideration. I, uh, I understand a tunnel past Hillsdale is probably going to be off the table, uh, but tunneling to serve OHSU is still on the table. Is that correct? I think there is, um, and I'm not 100% uh, up to speed on this, so, but my understanding is that there still is uh, a thought about is there a, a tunnel that diverts from one of the other surface alignments that can serve um, OHSU directly with mm -hmm. via an elevator. Um, you know, the other thing that we're looking at is other ways to serve OHSU. Um, so, for example, one of the, you know, when you're in these stages, I really like the fact that you get to have some wild and crazy ideas occasionally, mm -hmm. but there are uh, notions of other kinds of connections, say, between Barber and OHSU, which 
you know, in, in space are only 800 feet apart. So mm -hmm. there, there may be some other ways that we'll look at as well, in addition to the tunnel that we'll be able to evaluate at this early stage. Mm -hmm. But obviously, OHSU employees up on the hill, what, 19,000 people? So mm -hmm. it's a, as well as the important health services they provide. Yeah. So it's an important connection in the corridor. Yeah, I don't think our audience can see it on camera, but the tram is, at least in my view here, uh, I understand that the that serving OHSU via uh, the South Waterfront light rail is kind of off the table because the tram doesn't have enough capacity at rush hour to, to get all those people up there. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, you referenced the Metro High Capacity uh, Transit Plan, and the second line in that priority list is uh, Powell Division. Right. And Metro has just started up formal planning for that, and it's uh, beginning some citizen outreach. Um, it seems to be on a very fast track, mm -hmm. uh, and I think some of us wonder, uh, given that it looks like Southwest Corridor is you know, going to continue in sort of the more traditional planning process, which I won't call plotting, but we take our time to do it right. Um, I, I wonder if, if uh, Powell Division isn't actually being maybe positioned to leapfrog Southwest Corridor and, and get something perhaps a little bit simpler done first? Well, I don't, um, first of all, I think it is intended to be a relatively quick decision process. And um, it is still uh, a, a very early stage. I think the steering committee has sort of met officially once, you know, un informally twice, if you include an informal reception twice. So it really is just beginning the effort. Um, you know, it is a different kind of corridor, though, and I don't think anybody really thinks that this is um, really feasible to do a real heavy sort of infrastructure light rail project in that corridor. So then that leaves you with other kinds of alternatives that have a, an efficient use of the current rights away available, and that's, you know, there are, there are both rail and, and bus versions uh, of that. Um, so the hope is that we can get to some decisions on that relatively quickly. And then perhaps move that into whether it's the whole sort of federal new starts process. It may be you can size that for the small starts uh -huh. program, which allows us to sort of advance it independently of any other priorities within the in the region. And you know we've done that a number of times, uh -huh. um, and where we've done streetcar extensions, and we've used, for example, the streetcar that serves the district we're in right now was a federal project that was going on about the same time we were advancing the Portland Milwaukee project. So. We can do uh, smaller projects and big projects at the same time without throwing one or another off the, off, uh, off the schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, that's the vision that I see for this opportunity, but it's really early and so we have to be really open to right. the community and the needs and, and uh, expectations that are, and um, yeah, opportunities mm -hmm. that we find in that corridor. I would tell you that that um, Powell Division Corridor to me is really exciting in a lot of different ways. One is that it connects so many really important educational um, mm -hmm. uh, institutions. So if you start uh, at, with Portland State, uh, Oregon Health Science University, this OMSI district, uh, including the PCC Klein Center that's here, uh, you follow that out to um, the um, 82nd and division campus of Portland Community College and then out further to Mount Hood Community College and you begin to see mm -hmm. uh, some really key connections being made in the region. Um, so I think there's some really exciting things that can happen with that. And you know, that's something I know I'm, I'm meandering, but one <laughs> of the things that we have found over the last few years um, is a great collaboration with all of our educational institutions, but particularly with PCC. Mm -hmm and um, recently met with Dr. Brown, and he sort of explained one of the reasons why they think uh, public transit is so important, not only serving, we, we often have the same clientele, mm -hmm. um, but it's also really important to be able to allow them to centralize programs to offer more capacity in one location than they could if they could spread them out, and that means travel between those, uh, those campuses become even more important. Well, putting on my Portland Planning Commissioner hat, it also serves some very dense neighborhoods. Yes. Um, it serves, uh, potentially, depending on where you make the crossover from Powell to Division, uh, the Jade District, which is yes. a neighborhood prosperity area that the, the city is focusing on. Uh, and there are definitely some streetscapes that need a lot of improvement 
no question. along that corridor, so yeah. uh, potentially a lot of opportunities. And the great connection there at this mm -hmm. end is that the transit way, whatever it is, could avail itself of the Portland-Milwaukee Bridge mm -hmm. and the, if you will, expressway that we'll have for all modes up to uh, NATO and Lincoln. So again, already there's a good section of the alignment which would normally be a pretty congested segment for any transit vehicle to move through mm -hmm. that um, will offer exclusive right of way. So that's a great head start. So the way you talked about Powell Division reflects kind of a, um, a duality that I'm seeing in the community discussion. Metro still very much talks about as a high capacity uh, transit project with a mode to be determined they think light rail is still in the envelope. Um, when I hear tribal people talk about it, it is most often uh, as a BRT project. Mm -hmm. um, can you reflect on sort of those two different messagings that we seem to be hearing? Well, and I don't, it, uh, Metro's right. This is early. We're, we're going to learn a lot. We haven't eliminated any mode or any alignment, particularly within the corridor. So that's actually the proper place to be. I think you get from tribal people. Um, sort of jumping ahead a little bit uh -huh. and saying what's really practical and looking at what it takes to build a, a light rail alignment takes space that just doesn't seem readily available in a number of areas in the Powell Division corridor. So that's a challenge, and that, but that's again a way, uh, something, a trade-off that we can look at with the community and that's what this process is all about. Yeah, bus rapid transit is a continuum. I mean, you can sort of right. put as much into it as you want to. Exactly. And you could probably get as expensive on the high end as you are with, with light rail. Do you right. have a sense of where uh, this quarter might fall on that spectrum? Uh, I don't. Um, I, and I think that that will reflect a lot of the community um, input uh, that we'll get as we go through this process. Um, one of the things that I bring to the table, though, is the bias of not always doing the easy things. Sometimes we have to do some hard things to make sure that vehicles are, uh, transit vehicles have um, um, the ability to, to get through some of the heavily congested areas in the corridor. And that's, that's I think, is going to be the challenge is, you know, certainly you can put uh, bus rapid transit or streetcar or other things into the normal lanes of traffic. Um, and in many areas that will be just fine, but there are some areas that are not some traffic as we well know and we've got to sort of make sure that we figure out how to make sure our service is efficient through those areas as well so that our customers have really good service. 